Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for your patience. As you can see, we were going through some technical difficulties. Um, and my apologies to the people that I came to the room. I'm going to be speaking to you, but also to the back of the wall, um, because we've got a camera on, obviously, as well. Um, can I quickly introduce myself? My name is Professor Susan Kinnear. I'm the Dean of the School of Graduate Studies here at the University, and um, we've seen some emails from me in the last little while. Um, I wanted to begin our session by making an acknowledgement to our traditional elders. Um, so, in the Rockhampton campus, that's the Drummond people, they're the traditional elders throughout um, the country here. Um, but you might be aware that we're actually being joined by about 100 people across Australia. So there's some in the room here in Rockhampton. We've also got nine other campuses dialed on. Um, I could read out the names, but I won't, but they're all up and down the countryside. Um, and also, I don't know the traditional owners for all of those, but um, can we just make a general acknowledgement of the elders at those places as well? So, look, thank you all for coming. Um, for those online, thank you for your patience as we work through the technical difficulties. Um, I just want to mention that we do have Merrick um, and a couple of others from the School of Grad team um, online monitoring the chat line. So if you do have problems with not being able to hear or see us properly, or you've got some questions, pop them through on the chat because we will be able to get people to get back to you in that way. Um, I want to also acknowledge that we have um, site coordinators at all of the other campuses. So we have staff um, and in some cases RHD students who have joined us to help welcome um, these students in so that we can talk to you about research and, and what research involves. So thank you for giving up your time. Um, for those site coordinators, um, I hope you've found your way around to the campus and uh, lunch will be delivered shortly if it hasn't already. Um, again, um, you've got the numbers there to call if there's some technical difficulty that we need to resolve for you. So look, thank you for coming along today. Um, I guess this is probably um, something you've not participated in before because it's the first time we've ever done this kind of event. So, the School of Graduate Research at the University is a unit that looks after all of the students who undertake research at the University. So that means students who are doing uh, master's studies or PhD studies. Um, and most recently, we've also opened another qualification called the Graduate Certificate, and I'll mention that in a moment. But regardless of which discipline area the students come from, so you might be a, a nursing, uh, nursing research student or an engineering research student, um, we all look after those in one place called the School of Graduate Research. And what we found in the past is the university has a range of open days through the whole year um, where we invite students and parents on campuses to talk to them about the courses that the university has. Um, and really we find that people don't tend to engage very much with research at those events. They're there, you know, particularly the school leaders turning up with mum and dad, you know, trying to get themselves into engineering or psychology or something like that. So we thought we would do a dedicated session specifically for research. And in fact, I do those once a month. Um, so if you, if you don't hear enough from me today, which I'm sure you will, um, we can give you some information about the once a month sessions that we run. But for today, we wanted to make your group feel very special um, because the of the participants here today means one of two things has happened. So um, one is that we um, compiled a listing from students across the university for students who are doing really well academically in their coursework careers. So you're involved in your bachelor degree or your master's coursework degree and you're getting really good academic scores, you're exactly the kind of people that we would like to talk to about the prospect of coming to do research. So some of you may have been um, invited because of that reasons, that reason. Um, there's another group also where we actually wrote out to the leaders of the university, so research directors, um, some of our associate vice camp, uh, chancellors on the different campuses, and said, could you give us the name of students who you think have got great research potential? And that may not mean that they're academically brilliant. It might just mean that they're really interested in research, that they're passionate, motivated people that you think could become research leaders. And they gave us a list of names as well. So for some of you, you're here because you've actually been nominated by leaders around the university. So congratulations um, for either of those two reasons. It's great to have you here. Um, and that's not only for this group, but for all of those joining on um, online and also at the other campuses as well. So you've received a copy of the program, you got that by email, um, and you'll see there that we've got a number of different sessions happening today. Um, we wanted to share with you um, some experiences of current and past students. We've got Lee here in Northampton, um, and Holly, um, Polycia and Caitlin will be joining us later to talk about what it's like to actually be a research student. Um, then you'll hear from me a little bit around the actual detail of what is a research degree, what do they do, what do you do you have to go to lectures, how much do they cost, all that kind of basic information. Um, then we'll be stopping for a lunch break, um, and for those of you who are at a campus location, we're able to give you lunch. For those of you online, you have to go, my apologies, but um, hopefully you can um, bear with us and then we'll return for a second session after lunch. And after lunch, we've got a range of different researchers around the university who come in and they'll be just sharing with you kinds of research that the university does. Because one of the things we've found is that um, although you might regularly go to lectures and you're involved with your classmates, 
Um, it's actually not very common that you hear of undergraduate or postgraduate, coursework, postgraduate students knowing about the research that the university actually does. And there's a whole range of research that we do. So you might have heard about your lecturers talking about it, you might have heard about students, um, you might have demonstration students that come into your labs who are, you know, I'm a PhD student, I'm just here tutoring you for this week. We can actually talk to you about what those people are doing and how you might like to get involved at a later point. So I'm just going to charge on. Um, hopefully the chat line's being monitored if there are any questions along the way. Um, but for our first speaker, can I introduce Dr. Lee Sitz? Um, and Lee smiles because she loves being called Dr. One of the reasons I signed up for her PhD. Um, so Lee is our recent alumni of ours. Um, she obtained her PhD here in 2017. I was going to say 16, 17. Um, and Lee's just going to take you through some of her experiences about being a student at the university. Um, trials and tribulations, I think I can see on the slide. So I'll hand you over to Lee. And I will. Just <laughs> to my like a while with Dr. So it's been September 2017. I think I still get a little bit of a buzz and a little bit of excitement every time I hear. I don't know if that wears off or how that goes. But I wanted to talk to you today about um, my journey. So your journey will be different if you decide to do it. Everyone's experience is totally different. But um, if you can just bear with me, to sort of, I'll talk through mine. I get to talk about me for a little while instead of my topic for a change. So you might pick up some little pieces along the way that might help you in your decision. Um, I'm currently the executive officer at the Fitzroy Partnership for River Health, which is the natural resource management body in Northampton. It's actually only been there a couple of months, and it's my dream job. So I've kind of got to where I never expected that I would be. So this is part of the story that I'll talk you through today. I'm still trying to keep involved with. Um, I'm not sure if that's Susan. Just the down hour extra work. So how did I get here? I started, um, unlike a lot of people, I had dabbled a couple of other degrees and just didn't really do what I find what I liked when I first left school. So my part-time job kind of became my full-time career at the time. I was in hospitality and waitressing and that kind of thing. I then got married and had three kids and thought, there's got to be more to life. What do I really want to do? Um, my parents told me this, school told me that. I really want to study dolphins. I want to swim with dolphins and do dolphin research. How cool would that be? So I got online. Actually, I didn't get online. I grabbed a QTAC book and went through <laughs> and um, found that the only degree that I could do um, was Sydney University, which kind of looked like the perfect degree. It was a Bachelor of Aquatic Resource Management then, which is basically environmental science now, majoring in a, in a water management um, degree. I sort of then we moved to Rocky and I took advantage of that opportunity to be on campus rather than external, and I talked to all the lecturers and ended up doing a bit of volunteer work with um, a water chemist, actually. That kind of opened up a whole new world to me. I didn't really understand that research existed in that sense. I thought it happened in some weird laboratory somewhere in the abyss. I don't know where it happened, but I thought to myself, wow, ah, research is actually happening around me as we speak, and I can be part of this. And so I sort of stepped into honours, and people will take you different pathways. I'll tell you to do masters or do you ask them to upgrade to a PhD as sometimes possible? There's a whole lot of different ways of doing this. I love my honours degree, and I found it was just the perfect little stepping stone into research. So I got my own project. I had you know all that experience, not just in specialising in a particular area, but in like learning about time management, about how to budget, how to really manage the project. So project management in that bigger sense, and I just loved it. So I did a little bit of work for a while. I'm not really sure what I would do if I would do a PhD or not. I kind of thought, okay, research, I like it. Let's just stick with that. Um, and my topic kind of evolved. And a lot of people get sort of tied up in topics and supervisors. And for me, it was sort of a natural progression, in a sense, um, towards that ultimate you know, PhD topic. So don't get too wrapped up and worry about that. Um, and then finished my PhD in 2017, and I've done some work. I kind of thought okay, I'm going to be a researcher. This is great. And then I was actually offered the opportunity this new job, and um, it was a big decision for me actually to leave the uni and leave um, that kind of world. So I've kind of kept as an adjunct role here, and I'll keep researching. In fact, this morning I got a new paper published, Susan. So um, yeah, I, I still get those sort of goals really, really quite self fulfilling. So that was my journey. I don't know where I'm going to go yet. To next, we'll soon find out. Um, so pivotal moments along that that sort of story or my story were things like, you know, what do you, what do I really want to do? What's my personal goal? Where do I want to head? So really reach for the stars. Don't be afraid to jump in. 
And I've got that image of the lab. So research can seem like this scary world that you don't really know much about yet, and people kind of like have all this expertise and, and so on. Don't be afraid to sort of jump in. So you're often a fish out of water, I find. And um, I still, not so much now, actually, it's taken me a long time, but expect someone to kind of tap me on the shoulder and say, uh, you yeah, really shouldn't be here. You're not that smart, you know, you really don't know what you're doing. Um, and so the imposter syndrome is strong, you know, in people as you're going through. But don't be afraid to jump in and take risks. And I've put my own picture of Susan there, actually. I think that represents you well, Susan. Um, <laughs> don't you know, meet some people along the way. Take advantage of those role models and those, those people that you meet who will hold your hands through that journey as well. And that really was a pivotal moment in deciding to do a PhD for me with the support at, um, at CQU. So last time I stayed up, I thought, okay, I'm going to come up with some negatives and some positives. It's really hard for me. I'm a really um, overly biased. I don't know, but my journey has been amazing at CQ. I wouldn't swap it for anything, not just for the learning, but for the personal development as well. So negatives. Sometimes your research discipline might be quite small at CQ, and that can have some negatives. You might feel sometimes you're literally the only person that's studying your area. Um, it's hard work, sure. It's not a walk in the park. It's, you get paid to study. If I was lucky enough to get a scholarship, um, you know, what a dream. But it's, you know, it's hard work. And you do get pushed out of your comfort zone. And you start to seek that, actually. I started to want to get out of my comfort zone. So learning to talk. I couldn't get up and talk about this in a million years before I started. So you get a lot of opportunities to do that. Um, your brain really hurts, you know, it's like when you do an exam or an assignment, and it literally hurts, all those neurons. Developing new pathways, it just, so be prepared, be prepared for a lot of brain pain, and um, I think I'm addicted to that now, which I keep going back for it, I don't know what's wrong there. Positives, the small research centres. Um, you might be one of the only people, but that just creates amazing opportunities, because you're surrounded by other people doing research that have ideas that might be slightly out of your field, and also, at first, you don't want to do this, but it pushes you outside of the little comfort zone that is rocky or what campus you're in. So um, you sort of reach out to other researchers in your area of specialty, not only in Australia, but globally as well in the end. Um, so you kind of, that small risk, and not all the research centres are small. Um, I was one of a few doing my area of specialty. But so there's real benefits in that. Um, yeah, and we've got campuses everywhere. So. When, so we'll just skim through some of those positive things like facilities. If we don't have them on your campus where you are now, we'll have them somewhere around Australia, or we'll be able to get you access to the facilities that you need. So um, CQ is great at that. Personal career development, I think the training during your PhD is just the best. CQ's training is amazing. You get to do personal development. I just, if every time the training thing would come up, I'd just say yes. We came down to go, you go to that one as well. But like, yes, I'm doing everything. Take advantage of those opportunities, not only to develop your career and develop um, timeline management and you know, all kinds of career development for after a PhD, but also personal development that um, really kind of you know, hits home, you kind of find your space. So that was really beneficial. Um, the opportunity is to travel because of the multiple campuses. You don't always get that. Um, and also to do conferences. And so to really engage with some of the amazing people that I met Areas that people I never thought that I'd get to speak to at conferences, um, and then you kind of just touch base and, and then kind of um, develop relationships over time. Not only just Australia, but you know, some of the world experts. So there's nothing to stop you in that sense, I guess, too. So, tips for where you are now um, you can have a Google, you know, why should I do a PhD? And then it'll bring up a whole lot of things that mean nothing. Yeah. <laughs> There's stuff like, um, you know, it's not financially beneficial, or, you know, okay, or, or it might be, or, you know, there's all that stuff on Google. For me, there was, um, the main thing I think I can express to you is to talk to everybody that you run into. Everyone, librarians, anyone that you talk to, your lecturers, fellow students, track down the researchers. So Susan, I'm sure, go through the research pages. If you haven't already done that, just sit there scrolling. Instead of going on Netflix, go on the research pages. And actually have a good look at what people are doing here. It might not be related to what you're doing, but they can give you some amazing advice. So talk to everybody that you can. 
approach those experts and people that have published a lot of papers that kind of make a bit scared of, which I was, you might not be, you might be happy about doing that. Just remember to be respectful of their time, some of them are really busy, and obviously that academic hierarchy is important to respect and remember as well. So they're a professor for a reason, they've done a lot of work to get there. So. Um, and in that sense, find a mentor every now and then. That was one of the best pieces of advice someone gave me early on. And some of the people that were mentors for me didn't even know they were my mentor. I just kind of would touch base with them regularly, even if it was once every couple of months, and um, just kind of suck their brains, really. And, and then I'd take away what they told me and I'd put it in where I wanted it in my journey. Seek opportunities. So everyone says, oh, yeah, opportunities will come to you, the doors will open, you know, say yes. They do sometimes, sure, but you really have to go out and find them. So that comes from talking to people, that comes from scrolling through the internet, just saying, oh, there's a scholarship for that, or, you know, oh, that person's doing this, and it all kind of comes into place. So seek out those opportunities. And like I said earlier, don't worry so much about your topic yet or your supervisor. It's very much more of a big picture than that. Well, I think it is anyway. Um, unless you're in a specific discipline, you know, it's obviously clear to you what you would do. Um, so just, that will come, don't be afraid of that, or think, oh, I can't think of something amazing and no, no one's ever done before. Don't worry about that yet, just it'll come to you. I think that's pretty much all I've got. I had a great night last night, thanks Susan. <laughs> Looking through my journey and going through Facebook and having a look at photos of, um, and then my kids at the top, that's how old they were when I started undergrad and that's standing down there now. So in between all of that, there's pictures of things that I got to do. But really, it's the people that got me to where I am. So I should have pictures of my family and my supervisors and, and the RHD team and really everyone from the lab technicians to the librarians that really got me to where I am. So good luck, guys. It's not an easy decision, but I'm um, always here if you want to talk. They're my email addresses when I work on um, one of my new one. Um, I'm happy to chat about anything, even if I'm not the same to someone. So good luck with your decisions. Thanks very much. <laughs> Were there any quick questions of Lee before you let her run away? Oh. I don't know. Or would you like to hold them and, and um, mm -hmm. ask them over lunch or over chat perhaps? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Is she coming back? Is she yeah, I'll stay for lunch. Yes. Yeah. 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 She'll be around for those in Rocky. Um, oh. He's going to be here to um, catch up later. Right. Just bear with me. Pretty young there, that old man. And I noticed that a lot of time Lee was referring to PhD, which stands for Doctor of Philosophy. That was the course that Lee was in. It's not the only course we have, and we'll hear a bit more about that at the moment. But sometimes we slip into that habit of saying PhD when we actually need more research degrees. Um, look, for the next little while, what I was hoping to do was talk to you a bit more about the details of what research degrees actually are. Um, and because we have a very sort of audience, I can't sort of ask the um, hands up in the room. But um, sometimes I do do that, and most people don't even actually know what the PhD is. Don't feel like that's a stupid thing. You're actually quite normal if that's the case. <laughs> Lots of people have never heard of a PhD. I didn't myself. I, I did my own PhD at this university, or else I did my undergraduate career here. I don't think I've heard the word PhD until probably the end of third year, and it was honours year that you had to use to get to PhD. So that's really far too late in the future to be hearing about. It. Hence why we think days like this are really important. So I want to spend some time talking to you about what a research degree actually is, where it takes you, what you do, um, what it's like to be a part of a research student. Um, so the first thing I wanted to mention um, is I heard from a number of different people. We sent that first email out and said, how would you like to come in for Research Discovery Day? And you would be surprised how many people write back and say, I don't think I can do that, that's, that's the clever people. Or several, I think three, research sounds really scary. <laughs> um, so please don't think that is something we hear a lot as researchers. Research is just an organised way of looking at something. That's all it is. It's got project management in it, it's got budget management in it, it's got hypotheses if you're in the sciences, it's got questions if you're in education. Um, but it's just an organised way of exploring something. And the nice thing about a research degree is you get to pick what you do. So it's not like being in a, in a bachelor degree where you've got 12 subjects that you have to do in the first year and you don't get a choice. Maybe you might get some electives towards the end of second or third year. For your research degree, you can pick your own topic. And in fact, the whole point of doing a research degree is you're the only person that does that topic. If you're a 
PhD student, you actually finish up as the world expert in that area. There should be no one else in the world that knows more about it than you do. That is literally the definition of a PhD. So it's your chance to pick something you're passionate about. <laughs> and if that is, hey, I'm a type 2 diabetic and I want to know more about how to do my role in this, great, do PhD on that. If it is, I'm a civil engineer and I want to understand how to, you know, I don't know, I'll have a civil engineer account and how to organize concrete so that you know, my bridge doesn't collapse. Fine, you can pick that. It's really up to you what topic you pick. Um, with the caveats that you need to have a little bit of knowledge before you start about the general discipline area, and we need to find your supervisor that can help guide you. And I'll talk a bit more about that. So I guess the first thing is to dispel that myth that research is only for geniuses. It isn't. Yes, that was one that we kind of point to a lot, but none of us amongst here are Einstein at all. We're just people that really love what we do and we want to know more about. So why do a research degree? We touched on this a little bit. Um, I deal a lot with people in this phase of their decision making, and there's probably a bunch of categories you can really put people into, not that we like to categorise people, um, and, and all of them are valid. So one of the really obvious ones is you just got personal interest or passion in something. Um, I don't have time to show you the slide today, but I've actually got a demographic that shows all of the 430 students that we currently have in the university doing research. And they go from about 24, 25 years old up to about early 70s. So we have people from all ends of the spectrum. Um, and as you can hear, the ones who are in their 60s, 70s, they've completed their professional careers. They're not doing a PhD because they want to go and get a promotion. <laughs> They're in retirement. But they just have this interest and thirst of knowledge. Or they'd like to use their research degree as a chance to give back and to capture everything they've learned. Perfectly valid. We love to have you. We're not only here for people who are trying to get a PhD to go and do something fantastic in, in five years' time. So personal interest and passion is really important. Um, some people are doing it because they want the career change. Um, the average age for our cohort at the moment is somewhere between 45 and 55. So I'm dealing with students who have been in the workforce longer than I have, but they've said, I don't want to do this job anymore. I really want to go somewhere else. And research can be your way to actually connect up to a new pathway. Um, the other thing is uh, people who are quite happy in the sector that they're in, so they might be in allied health, they might be in, in sciences, they might be in uh, medical fields, um, but they really reach the top of where they're going to get unless they take an extra, an extra step. Um, and that's really where you get the divergence between should I go and take a master's degree coursework, so an MBA or a master of clinical practice, and keep going as a practitioner, or should I actually take a little left turn and go and do a research degree which will allow me to step up into a different part of the workforce or to keep going, get into managerial roles after that. So all of these things are relevant um, in terms of making a decision about a research degree. Um, the last one on the list, my apologies for those online, I really don't know how well zoomed in I am, so I'm pointing at the screen, I don't know if you can see me. The last one on the list is about um, something we call entrepreneurship or commercialisation. Uh, particularly at the doctoral level, as I said earlier, if you're doing a PhD, it means you're the world expert in that field. And for some people, that may mean you might like to turn that into a business. So some people come to us to do their PhD so they can become a consultant in management or so that they can open up a research company in engineering technologies. That's possible too, and we can talk to you about um, patenting your work that you create during your research degree with us. We have all those kinds of things to support you along the way. So lots of different reasons that you might actually think about going this way after you finish the studies you're doing. So a little bit around um, our team, and I've mentioned some of this already. Um, so we're called the School of Graduate um, We currently got, it says 420, we've had a couple of new since then, so I think we're up to about 430 students at the moment, that's across Australia. Um, internationally as well, we actually do PhDs offshore. So that's something to think about, which I mentioned um, in a little while. And we currently run about one in five for international students. So lots of Australian New Zealand citizens, but also some international students as well. Um, the last two on this list I really wanted to make a point of. So it's really, really common for our research students to study part-time. Um, that's important if you perhaps don't want to be a full-time student um, and make this your career for the next few years. Lots of us are in the luxurious position of being able to give up our jobs and family and everything else to go and study a PhD for a few years. But you can do it part time, and in fact, you can swap between part time. 
up at a lot on at the moment, and um, particularly really young people. Lots of people are balancing um, research, and, uh, research and work at the same time. And the other thing is about distance ed. So we've got a bunch of campuses that you probably know if you've been in city here. We've got campuses all over the place. Um, we currently do on campus um, research at about 13 different locations, but we also have lots of people who just study by distance. Unless you need to be accessing a laboratory or a field site, there's lots of research that you can just do with a laptop anyway. Um, so we're quite happy for you to be wherever you like. And in fact, what's quite common is that you might be at an off-campus location, but your supervision team will be somewhere else. So because CQ's got so many campuses, we might have a student that's here in Rockhampton, that their supervisor team is one in Melbourne, one in Brisbane. That's fine, as long as you're happy to you know, collaborate with each other in that way and your, your research is going along. We can handle that too. So we'll try and give you that message that it's super flexible if you can fit in with where you are, where you need to be. Just to stop for a little moment and talk, and I don't want to bore you to death with this young qualifications framework, but um, you might be aware that once you leave um, high school in Australia, so post secondary, um, there's a thing called the AQF, the Australian Qualifications Framework, and it's just a way of categorising all the qualifications that are offered through state and universities up here in school. It starts at 1 and it goes to 10. So for those of you who are in a bachelor degree, you're probably at HUF level 7. That's usually where the bachelor degrees sit on that screen there. Um, when I'm talking about research degrees, we're talking about the last two on the run or on the tie. So the master's degrees are sort of 9, doctoral degrees are at level 10. The reason I'm explaining this now is because there are also other kinds of master's degrees that the university offers. But those are master's coursework degrees. So master's coursework is where you go to lectures, you have units, you go do exams, you hand in assignments. That's a coursework degree. It's a classroom-based environment. It's also at level nine. So a research master's is where you get your own topic, you have two supervisors working with you, and you don't go to class. We're just having some other campus issues with sound, Susan. Can okay. you just um, maybe see if you can get the other campuses to yell out if they can hear you properly? Yeah, okay. We'll do a campus quick check. So Brisbane, can you give us a way if you can hear us? Yes. At the end of the rhythm. Adelaide, can you want to try? Yep, we can hear you. We can hear you. Yep, we're good. Yeah. We're missing you. So, a car is good. Okay, so Adelaide, we're in Rocky North. I think, I think the actual locations are all good. I think it's the Zoom participants. Oh, okay, brilliant. Mostly. Uh, so, we've got Cairns, we've got Gladstone. Mackay, Noosa, Sydney and Townsville. Any drums? There's a few people saying good now though. Good now? Might be okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for letting us know. Please let us know again if it happens again. Hey, no, so then, good morning. In the midst of explaining um, where these degrees sit, so um, I just wanted to avoid the confusion when you hear the word masters, there might be two different stories going on there. Some are masters coursework, some are masters research. But by the time you get to level 10, which is the, the last degree on the whole list, that's only for the doctoral degrees and they should only really be talking about research degrees. The important thing with the PhDs or the doctoral degrees, um, they're globally recognised, so no matter where you go from Australia, if you're, if you're a PhD graduate, like Dr Lee sits over there, she will be Dr Lee sits no matter which country she goes to. It's a globally transportable degree, um, and it will be recognised as that in whatever country you go to. Not, usually that's the case also with the research masters, but not as solid as definitely the case. Okay, so um, what we have in, in our course listing, and that um, picture that you see on screen is a bunch of supervisors doing what supervisors do best, so I told you about distance education, that's how they go about it. Um, so we have a range of different degrees available. Um, the first one um, is not truly a research higher degree, it's the graduate certificate. So if you think back to that coloured pie, it's actually level 8, it's not level 9 and 10. The reason we have a graduate certificate in research is Masters and doctoral degrees have special criteria that you need to get into them. Some people can't meet that criteria, so we have a graduate certificate that you can do first and will enable you to get to the next degree stage. Um, I'm happy to talk about that in detail a bit later if people would like to hear about it. In the interest of time, I'll probably just hold it over for the We still don't know how to take on it? Yep. Next on the list, we have the Masters by Research. Now, if you've had the happy experience of Googling us on the handbook, you'll see that there's actually nine different Masters by Research names there. So we've got a Master of Engineering, we've got a Master of Applied Science, and all of these names. Please just know that they're all exactly the same degree. 
They are all masters by research, so they're a two year long degree where you take a topic and you get supervisors and you go and do research. The only reason they've got different names is because they're in different discipline areas. And even that is a bit of a stupid scenario because we get someone who might be an engineer who wants to engineer medical devices. So do you belong in an engineering degree or do you belong in a medical degree? We don't know. So multidisciplinary projects really don't fit that model very well. Um, what we are actually in the, in the midst of doing is collapsing all of those nine names, throwing them away and just saying, let's just call it a master's by research degree because that's what it is. It doesn't matter what discipline you study. Um, the next one down is the Doctor of Philosophy. And again, if you go on the handbook, there's three different ones. They're all exactly the same. It's just the silly discipline names. And soon, you won't see three different names. You'll just see the one name. So a PhD, Doctor of Philosophy, um, three to four years. Um, can be in any discipline you like as long as we've got super. There's also two other kinds of doctoral degrees on the list, and most people have never heard of these, and they get really quite concerned when they find out that there's something other than a PhD that you can take. So these two here are called the Doctor of Education and the Doctor of Professional Studies. The reason they're different, two main reasons, um, one is that they have different entry requirements. So they are degrees where if you haven't come through a traditional academic pathway, so you haven't you know, done a bachelor or a master's degree, or even if you've been out of study for quite a while, um, we can look at your professional experience and admit you on the basis of what you've got for work experience. The other main difference is in the first year, it's a little bit different course structure. So in the first year of those two degrees, we don't push you straight into a big topic you've got to manage all by yourself. We actually give you four smaller jobs to do first in the first year, and then you're going to do the big topic after that. So that's the main, fundamentally the main difference between them. The reason there's two, the Doctor of Education is for people who are in education, so it's usually primary and secondary school teachers, school principals, um, people in the university environment, that's the kinds that we get in that degree. Professional studies is everybody else, but mostly people who are in business, it's the most common one that we get there. The Doctor of Philosophy by portfolio, um, I'll just mention, it probably won't be relevant to most of you. It's a special case of a PhD where if you've already done some research papers, you can actually bring them to the university and basically get like recognition of prior learning for them. It's a one year PhD. If that sounds too good to be true, it kind of is. You can't possibly do a PhD in one year. The reason it's only one year is because you've done most of the work before you even came to us and we just paid you up. So. Um, and the last one is just the offshore degrees. By structure, they're all exactly the same, but just to be aware that we do allow you to take your degree offshore. And most people sort of go, oh, that's got nothing to do with me. But actually, if you're going to do a PhD part-time, you might be with us for five or six years. And during that five or six years, you might get a fantastic job offer overseas. You might have to go back and visit families. You've got family living in other countries. You can take it with you. You don't have to stop studying. You don't have to leave your degree and come back later. You can actually just keep going. So it's good to know. All right, let's keep going. This one here has got an awful lot of information on this slide. And what I forgot to say right at the beginning is we're very happy to send a copy of these slides out. So don't feel like you need to scribble all this down. I'll email them all out to you after the session. Um, and this is pretty much the information that you get on a handbook in any case. I just put it all on one slide so it's a bit easier to find. <coughs> um, it just goes through the basic overall structure. So for a master's degree, you're looking at about two years for a full-time um, course. For a doctoral degree, somewhere between three and four years. As I said, you can do it part-time if you like, which means you just double all of the time that I've just talked about. That said, most of our part-time PhD students aren't here for eight years. They tend to finish in about five or six. Um, research degrees are strange beasts. So around the university, we get quite used to saying, yes, but we're research and we're different. So we don't have term dates. We don't have to start and finish your term. You don't have to have a special application date. You can just turn up at any time during the year and put an application in and start when you like, as long as it's not a public holiday. Um, it's very flexible in that sense. Um, I've talked about all the campus locations. Probably the one that's of most interest to you guys um, is the entry requirements, so what you actually need to get into one of these degrees. Um, in short, for a master's degree, you need to finish the bachelor, um, which is pretty much most of you in this room, or will be in another few months or years' time. Um, so if you've completed a bachelor degree, and preferably if you've got some good academic standing in that degree, you can usually go straight into a research master's. Having said that, it needs to be a master's that is relevant to the bachelor degree you hold. So if you're an engineer and you turn up and ask me to go into the nursing research degree, I'm going to say I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> so, and it does happen, believe it or not. Um, so it needs to be in a, in a related discipline. Um, for the PhD, we're usually looking at bachelor honours. And I cringe when I say that because honours is something that most people don't have anymore. 
There's a few exceptions to that, so psych and engineering still do honours, it's pretty common, but you have to do it for accreditation. Other areas of the university tend to not do honours much anymore, and in fact, if you ask me how many honours students we've admitted, I would struggle to even give you some names right now. We don't tend to see honours students coming in as such. Um, what we do tend to see is people who've done their bachelor degree, and then they've done coursework masters, um, but in the master's degree, and that's a coursework one where you go into classes, they've had to do a mini project or a mini dissertation, we call it. So it means they've got some research experience. That means we can put them into the PhD um, straight away. There's also lots of other things we can do. So we'll have a look at your CV and your professional experience and what you've done in your job and all that kind of stuff. Um, and one of the offers I make, and I'll make to everyone here, um, is if you want to send your CV in and just ask me, what do you reckon I'd be able to get into? Just send me your CV and I can tell you that over email. You don't have to get online and fill out all the application form to figure out where it is you might be actually going. So you're more than happy to do that for people. Um, PhD by Foley is a special case, that's the recognition of higher learning degrees, so I won't go too much into that one now. And if you want to go offshore, um, sometimes we're a bit more strict with that, just because we know it's a bit of an extra challenge to take your degrees offshore, but we want to know that you're going to be well to do that. I do sometimes get the question about students who do completely coursework masters. So someone who's done an MBA or a Master of Clean Psych, um, or a Master of Project Management and Engineering, if there's no research in that masters whatsoever, I'm going to be really reluctant to put you into the PhD because you've never done research before. It'll be too hard. What we can do is get you into the research master's degree, and after the first year, you can shift across. So there is actually a pathway there as well. So you don't have to go straight to PhD, but it sounds a little bit too confronting. You can start at the easier master's level and move across. Um, grad cert, oh, I didn't even have this slide in there. So grad cert is just, you know, <coughs> if you need it. Um, it also is a bit of a strange beast. So it's a qualification where you can turn up at any time. You can do it in as little as six months, or you can take as long as two years if you like. We don't actually mind how long it takes you, as long as you come back at some point and go, I've done everything I need to, here can you assess me and give me a qualification. Um, so it's fully flexible and um, we can guarantee you, if you do the grad cert research and you get a distinction level average, we guarantee you into a master's degree, so you know that you're sure that you can get to the next degree after that if you choose. I wanted to talk a little bit around Structure. Sorry, there's no clock in this room. Am I going to have time? <laughs> 12 17. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the course structure because I keep saying that it's not like a classwork kind of enrollment. Um, so you're like, well, what do I actually do as a research student? What do they do between nine and five? Um, so it's an independent study project. You pick a topic and you work on it. So you might be a scientist and you decide to go and run a bunch of experiments. You might be involved talking about those later. Um, that's your project. You go, you claim your experiments, you go and buy all the stuff you need, you go into the laboratory, run the experiments, come back and write about it. That's, that's all of what you need to do as a PhD student. If you're an engineering student, you would do the same thing for an engineering topic. If you're an education student, you might go off and do interviews in schools, whatever that is. It's all about individual project based learning. By and large, you're not going to any lectures. There's one exception to that, which I'll mention in just a moment. So it's not about you coming to classes, it's not about assignments, it's not about exams as such. Purely what it is, pick a topic, execute that topic, and write what we call a thesis, which is basically a very long project report, which is how you get examined. So there's only one exam examination, you have to write it end. Um, a lot of people really struggle with that to begin with. So you're used to going to classes having units and knowing what you're supposed to be doing week two or week eight and when your assignments are due. With a research degree, none of that really applies. It's really up to you to individually manage your time and for your supervisors to help guide you with that. For some people, they love that freedom. For other people, they're frightened <laughs> because they don't understand what they're supposed to be doing. And sometimes you can feel a bit lost in the sea of, am I doing this right? Am I doing this quickly enough? What's going on? So there is a little bit of structure that we put in. And the, the easiest way for me to explain this is it's a bit like going and getting your driver's license for a car. So when you first turn up to the university and say, oh, Susan, I'd like to do a PhD degree. I say, okay, give me a quick two pages on what you think your topic would like to be. So you've basically just done your written license check, you know, for you to get your learner's permit. You're not a researcher at this stage. You don't even know really much about research and we don't expect much. A lot of people think, um, really deeply about that topic area that they give us when they first come in on admission, you won't even know what it looks like by this stage. You don't have the skills, your supervision team is not 
But the topic that you pick right at the beginning is probably not going to look a lot like what you end up graduating with at the other end. So don't don't just sit there and agonise about what you put in that first two pages. It's just an indication for us at this point. Once you get into the ambition of the degree, so now you've got your learner's permit, you can start driving the car. But it's like having a <coughs> you've got to have someone in the other seat with you, which is what your supervision team is for. And in the first year, that's when you clock up your, your learning hours. You're actually going now to read more about your topic, find out what other people have done for research in that field. Um, you'll actually draft up some proper questions for what you want to answer. You'll think about how you actually do those experiments or those interviews. Um, you'll think about a budget, you'll think about a timeline, you'll think about the missions that you've got to ask for. And all of that we wrap up in the first year. And we have a thing called confirmation of damage, which is basically like getting your feet like so after that first big exercise, you've now thought a bit more carefully about what you're doing by saying, yep, yeah, we understand, we think you've got some basic skills, we confirm you, which means you've got your pig plates. You can now go and drive a car on your own, but you need to just be careful what you're doing. It's not until you actually graduate two years later that you get basically on your open job, driving permit, if that makes sense. Because by then, you're actually a researcher, that's what you graduate as. So a lot of people really think that they need to turn up to us with a fully fledged research idea and be very clear about what they're doing. Lots of PhD students don't know what they're doing after the first year, so don't stress too much that. Um, the other thing, I guess, along the way is, as you can hear, so you do all this thing in the first year, finish the first year, but I've told you that a master's degree takes two and a PhD takes three or four, so what do we do with you between years one and the rest? Because that's a really big gap. Um, so we need to keep an eye on you, and you need to be able to tell us if things are going right or wrong for you. So we have six monthly progress reports. So in April and September of this year, we're currently working through a few batch of them for this April, um, we like to check in with you and say, how's your project going? Are you still getting on with your supervisor? Have you run out of money yet? Is there anything else we need to know about? So that's the structure that we're putting in. And then by the time you get to the end, it's just the examination. So you, you write that thesis, which goes out to two international experts. So your supervisors don't get enough to work. They already know you too well by that stage. They actually send it to global experts. We'll find the best people in your field and say, this is brand new knowledge in their field. Do you think this is appropriate for the degree? It's not actually marked in the university. Um, just quickly, uh, the exception to the rule that I mentioned earlier about going to classes, we did have one course per unit, and it's called Prepare for Confirmation. Um, it's a 12-week it's a unit, and it's just there to help you understand what documents we need from you at the end of that first year. It's fully online, so you can take it from anywhere, um, and it's offered three times a year, so you can sort of catch the next day. All right, I probably need to go a little bit more quickly. Um, I wanted to mention research priorities or research strengths you might sometimes hear them referred to as. So if you engage with our research community at all, that's it, you'll start hearing things like research strengths. This is a group of topics that we refer to, and it basically um, highlights areas that the university has got research activity in. Is there's a few reasons why that's really important for you to know. Um, one is, is if you can think of a research strength area, so if it comes under this listing that's up on the website, and you can see there some of the billions of that website which we'll send out to you. If your particular research interest area sounds like one of those research strengths, that's a really good um, signal for you. If it's a research strength, it doesn't just mean that we've got people doing it. It means we're doing really well in it. It means there should be multiple staff doing it, there's probably some students doing it, and it probably means the university is already investing in it. So we'll have those laboratories, we'll have that equipment already available. So research priority areas are something you could think about situating yourself under, if possible. Um, it's a pretty long list, I think there's about 32, lists, uh, 32 items on that list there at the moment, and they're really broad. So I mean, you can see at the moment, one is, one is psych and well-being. They're really big topic areas. So. Um, in due course, if you want to go and have a browse on the website, have a look at those areas, that's a really good thing too. Having said that, if you look down that area and you think, well, it's got nothing to do with anything that I'm interested in, it doesn't mean the answer is no. It means come and have a chat with us and we'll talk to you about whether or not we could support the research topic that you're interested in. This may seem a little strange, but there will be some people where I will say, um, I don't think you should bring your research to this university. Now, I'm the dean, it's my job to go and get students. <laughs> But it's really not um, ethical of me to accept you into the university if we don't think we can give you the best environment. So you might have seen all of the recent media about the girl who took the photos of the black hole um, at the Smithsonian. 
Uh, if she turned up here, I would say, you know what, City is not the best place for you to be. We don't have an astronomy department here, we don't have the equipment, we don't have telescopes, there is no way you're going to actually be able to get a good PhD from us. Particularly if you're working at PhD level, you need to go and find the experts in your field. Now we would love if they were here, and if they are, we'll do everything to support you. But if it's a topic we can't support, I'll probably say, you know what, can I put you in touch with someone down at Griffith, or can I send you to James Cook or wherever the other university is, because I tend to know where research goes on elsewhere. And I might say to you, we'd love to have you, but it's actually better that you don't. For your sake, go and find the best experts so that you can get the best support that you need. Okay. Um, I can probably skip over a bit of this detail, um, but you've heard already that I've said you don't need to have a full topic completely thought out. Even if you just got some random ideas, that's enough for us to start with. Come and have a chat with me, come and talk with your lecturers in your classrooms and say, look, I'm interested in doing research, can you tell me who I can talk to about this? And it just works from conversations. So even if you just want to send an email saying, I've got three dot points, I'm really interested in doing something like this, I'll say, okay, well, I know Professor X and Dr. Y, we're going to go and chat with them and see if it works out. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. You don't need to come with a three-page perfect proposal of exactly what your topic is going to be. Um, the other thing is your topic will probably evolve a little bit. Um, so most people who turn up, and it's the really enthusiastic students that come and they write me an email saying, oh, do you want a PhD? And these are all things I want to study. And I'm like, there's about six PhD topics in there. You've only got three years. Um, so most people have to narrow down. And you might be able to do that on your own because you don't know what it looks like. A supervisor or one of the academic staff around the university will be able to sit down with you and say, look, if you want to do a PhD, let's just carve out this part and just do the PhD on this bit. So expect it as change. Don't sort of hold on to that topic as your only one that you're going to be able to work with. The other thing is about supervisors. So I mentioned that word quite a bit, and maybe some of you are wondering what a supervisor is. Um, a supervisor is your academic mentor or guide through your degree. So research is about being very independent. You're expected to do the work yourself. You can't do it on your own. So we give people at least two supervisors. So we have a principal supervisor and at least one associate. The principal, as the name suggests, is the person who's your primary point of contact. Usually they're an expert in your field. Uh, and then the associate are extra helpers. Often they're experts in the field as well, or they might be pastoral care people, or they might just be someone extra for you to talk with and chat to, um, but you'll need at least two supervisors. The principal supervisor has to be here at the university, so they have to be a staff member on our academic staff. Um, if we can't find a principal supervisor for you, that's when we would say, well, you need to maybe look at another university. But the associate supervisor can be from anywhere. You can have one or more of them. So if you have found Professor X here at CPU, who's willing to be your principal, but you know a fantastic researcher who's down at RMIT, you can ask them to be on your panel too. It doesn't have to stay within the university. You can also get an external person from industry, and sometimes that's really useful because it means you get that connection to the actual workforce as well. So there's all that possibility um, also. Um, the advice I would give for, super, for finding a supervisor um, is take your time and make sure you're really, really sure before you sign up to work with that person. So yes, they should know a lot about the research that you're doing. They should also be someone you get along with, because you're going to be spending an awful lot of time with them in the next few years. And you might need to think also about your learning style. So a lot of people I know come to me and say, I really want to work with Professor ABC because they're fantastic, they've got these publications, you know, they're really well regarded in the field. And I say, yes, but Professor ABC is really busy, so unless you're expecting to not have any time with them, like maybe you can meet with them once a fortnight, they're probably not going to be the right person for you to work with. Whereas Dr. A <laughs> might not be so busy or well regarded, but it means that any day you're going to be able to meet with them, you know, maybe once a week and get, get what you need. So build a team around you based on what you need. If you're someone who needs a lot of talk, who wants to meet regularly, who needs a lot of guidance, don't go picking someone who's really busy. Make sure you've got someone who's disabled. The other thing is around um, geography. So some students are not at all bothered by having their supervisor in another city. Um, and we're not bothered by that at all either. But if you're someone who'd rather bump into you, bump into your supervisor in the corridor, or you want to be actually in a laboratory where they're working alongside you, you're going to need to find a supervisor as well. So you need to think about that also. The other thing I'll mention super quickly, um, we do actually provide funding. So if you're not at the same place as your supervisor, we will get you on a train and I'll meet them regularly. It just helps with your relationship. Okay, um, this listing here um, is just a quick um, view of our research centres and institutes. 
So uh, a centre is a group, is a small group of staff doing research. An institute is a bigger group of staff doing a research um, theme area. Um, you might recognise some of these or not. Um, this links with the research priorities. So if we've got centres and institutes operating, usually it's because it's one of our priority areas. So the same message applies. If you can see your interest areas listed here, go and find the director of that research centre and ask if you can talk to their staff. Um, the two at the bottom are not staff groupings, they're student groupings. So we just established these things called academies. So they're groups of research students, PhD students or master students doing work together. Um, there's one in creative arts, um, and you'll hear from Liz later on this afternoon. Um, and there's one in clean energy, which is that solar power and renewables, all that kind of thing. And the gentleman might mention a bit about that later. Um, so I'm interested in most areas, that's super good, because they're actually groupings of students working there. Okay, lastly, because I must be running very close to time by now, I want to talk to you about funding. It's probably the most obvious question that you want to have answered when you came here today. Um, there's probably three different things to think about with funding for research degrees, and most students have only thought of two. <laughs> so the funding triad is around how much does it cost to actually do the degree, um, how are you going to support yourself, living wise, um, whilst you're staying with and thirdly, which is one most people forget, is how are you going to pay for the research itself, because all research costs money. So let's super quickly go through those three. The first one is the really good news item. <laughs> so course costs for domestic students. So if you're an Australian citizen or a New Zealand citizen, or you have permanent residency of either of those two countries, we classify you as a domestic student. I know New Zealanders are not considered domestics if you're a bachelor degree, but for research, we count the Kiwis in with us. So you're all good. <laughs> if you're in one of those categories, there is no cost to do a master's or a PhD degree. There are no fees. Commonwealth government gives us a place and we can give it to you because we don't use them all up. So it's literally free to come and do a master's degree or a PhD degree with us if you're a domestic student. If it sounds too good to be true, it almost is. <laughs> the catch is the Commonwealth place only goes for the standard duration of the degree. So if you're signed up to do a master's degree, which should take you two years, if you've been a bit lazy and haven't done all your work, it's not finished after two years and you need to keep going, the Commonwealth place drops out and you have to start paying out of your own pocket. Having said that, if you do your work on time, and most of our students do, there will be no cost. The Commonwealth Place will cover you, and it's all good to go. The only thing you will need to pay for is that one there, the staff, the Student Association fees. You should probably know that name because you're already all paying it. <laughs> um, so that's the Student Association fees, um, and they're a couple hundred dollars for six months. So that's the standard ones that you would already be paying the students at the university now. If you're an international student, um, the Commonwealth Place doesn't apply for international students, unfortunately. So there is a course cost. Um, the course cost is as you see on screen, so it's about 25 to 30 a year. The reason there's a range is because some research is more expensive than others. So desktop um, disciplines, um, humanities, um, education, business, at the cheaper end of the scale, sciences and engineering, I'm, I'm lumping terribly, but sciences and engineering seem to be at the more expensive end of the scale. So if you're an international student, you will need to um, consider the tuition fees, and the international courses have to do their overseas health cover. For the international students in the room, a virtual room, you'll know what I'm talking about already. But so most people are completely unaware that for domestics, it's actually free to stay. Second thing is around how you're going to support yourself as a student. So I've already mentioned that lots of our students um, study part-time. That's because they've got a full-time job, which means they're all good. They've got income, they're living day to day, they can pay their rent, they can get their groceries. For those of you who might want to consider doing full-time study, um, it's possible that you could just, uh, juggle a job as well as full-time PhD. Maybe not for very long, unless you're really dedicated, um, but it's possible. Um, for some people who want to do it as a full-time proposition, um, you would need to think about another way of supplementing your income. We do have scholarships available. So we do have what we call living stipends, which is basically we give you a scholarship that you take home and you know, pay your discretionary expenses with. Um, I need to be honest and say we have a small number of scholarships. We are always oversubscribed. So you need to be quite competitive to be considering getting a scholarship. The scholarships are there for domestic and international students. Um, usually there's a base rate one that's about $28,000 a year, which is tax-free. So if you're a full-time student, it's $28,000 or so tax-free. If you move to part-time, usually that means it becomes taxable, but I'm not going to be taxation office and I can't give you taxation information. <laughs> so usually it becomes taxable. But if you're sitting at home doing your sums, saying, well, I don't know how I'm going to work this out, you know, think about the implications of getting a scholarship. 
Um, we've got a couple of special ones. So women's, we've got a women's award for people who have an introduction to their career. We've got the Indigenous Award. Um, they're a bit higher, so they're 35,000. The other thing I will mention, really good time for you guys to be hearing this, um, is we can actually partner with industry to get them to give you a sponsorship as well. So sometimes the university will be able to put in a little bit of money and get industry partners to help you. Um, engineering sciences in particular do a lot of that kind of thing. I like health will also do that sort of thing. But getting an industry sponsorship tends to take time. Plan for a six to 12 month long conversation to organise a scholarship with an industry partner before you get there. They can happen sometimes a bit quicker than that, but I wouldn't be counting on it. I would say now, if you're in third year, go and have a chat with the lecturing staff and say, I'm keen to do a PhD, you know, maybe mid next year. Can we start talking about how I can get funding for that? And you might be talking funding for you to take personally as a scholarship or for them to fund your research project, or both, sometimes that happens too. So yes, we have scholarships. Um, you can in, read the info on the scholarships website, but just be prepared that they are super competitive. You need to be a um, really good quality applicant to get one. The last point, and then I promise I'll finish up because I know lunch has arrived here and it probably has at other locations too, um, is around your project itself. So all research costs money. Um, if you're in the science and engineering, it might cost quite a lot of money. Um, if you're lucky and you're in the desktop disciplines, you might just need a computer and a recording device to go take some interviews with the participants. But there's always a cost associated. The nice thing about our university is that we actually make really generous funding support for you. So we think it's really important that you learn how to manage your budget and you don't sit there worrying about how to buy things that you need for your research. We want you to actually go and do the research. So we give two different um, funding pools to every student that comes in. So if you're a um, PhD student, we'll give you up to $6,000 to spend on your research project. So you might go and buy pet producers for your lab, or you might go and hire a car to drive out to your field site, or you might take it to go and visit your supervisor. All of those are expenses that you can classify on under that $6,000. Uh, for a master's student, it's, it's $4,000. The other thing we do um, is support you to get to conferences. Super important for you to get out and get to conferences. A couple of reasons. One is it's great networking, so you build professional um, contacts. You might meet employers, you might meet other researchers you can collaborate with. Secondly, it gives you the skills to go to a conference and present your work. We don't give you money to just go and sit at the back of the room, you actually have to go and present. Um, and thirdly, um, it allows you to get feedback on your research early on in the piece. So if you've done a little bit of research, take it to a conference, tell it to the room, get them to tell you if it's any good, because you'd much rather know about it there than find out when you're getting your thesis examined to it, maybe things weren't going so well. <laughs> so conferences are really important. They're also really expensive, so we give some money to get to those. So for PhD students, four and a half thousand dollars to get out to conferences. Master students get three thousand. Now that might mean you go to one really big expensive conference in Bali at the end of <laughs> wherever. So yes, there is national as well. So you can save it all up and go to one conference at the end, or you might choose to go to several smaller conferences within Australia every year for your degree. It's, it's quite up to you and your supervision team to choose how to best spend that money. We will ask questions, but generally speaking, we're quite <laughs> Okay. Um, these last points I'm just going to skip over because um, I'm running out of time, but I guess I just wanted to let people know that there is a range of different support available, uh, and I won't bore you with all the details. We do get people coming along to say, particularly around statistics, I hate statistics, I'm frightened, I don't know how to do them, I can't do research because I don't know how to do statistics. We'll actually support you with that, so we can actually pay for you to get a consultant statistician to sit down and work with you. You're not supposed to know it yet. You're a research student. Your supervisor should have a good idea of what's going on, but you're supposed to be there to train. So don't feel like you need to know that just yet. Um, at this point, we are giving our laptops to students. Um, we may, may or may not continue that into the future. If we don't give you a laptop, we'll be replacing it with some sort of other scheme. The idea is that we want you to have all your research data safe in one place that we know where it is and backed up. <laughs> so at the moment, we do that by a laptop scheme. It may change in the future. Um, the other thing is that we, um, Lee mentioned the research training that we do. So we have um, three times a year, basically you guys would call them residential schools, we call them intensives. So we get students to come in and visit us for a week and we supply you with a whole lot of training. So we'll teach you how to do budgets and ethics applications and all of those things. Um, one of those uh, in the middle of the year, happens in July, is here in Rockhampton and we'll actually sponsor you to get here. So we'll pay to fly you here and live, live in Rockhampton for the week and experience our beautiful town, for those of you who are on online, um, and, and get your training for that week as well. 
So we, we do try to support you along the way and make sure you've got the skills that you need. I'm going to leave it at that because that's probably way over time already. Um, this last point was just around um, not so much about research degrees, but just if you want to get interested in research generally. So maybe signing up for a PhD sounds like a whole bunch of part team right now. Um, but please <coughs> keep, keep your hand in. So there's lots of ways you can get involved in research around here. Um, ask your lecturers. They might have research projects that you can help be assistant on. We do have a research volunteering scheme. If you're lucky enough, they might have paid research assistant roles, but you know, don't, don't think that they're easily available. There's not a lot of them sometimes. Um, and it's not just at this university, so there are any number of places that you can Google online to find out how to get involved with other research projects. You might even want to just get involved in research projects as a participant. So when you see, you know, those emails coming out across the student broadcast saying, oh, we can do people doing a survey, have a go at it, learn about what it's like to actually do research as a participant from that side of things. Last, I keep saying that, so <laughs> <we'll stop. laughs> Last two, um, one is that we have a summer research scholarship scheme. So, um, we do this once a year, so we actually announce a scheme where you can actually do a short-term project over the Christmas break between November and February. Um, it's $500 a week um, living allowance and $2,000 to spend on your project. So I'm anticipating that in about April we'll call for that. So if you see this summer, summer scholarship scheme come out, put down for it, put in an application. You need to find a supervisory project and you can do something over Christmas. It's a great way to test research out and see if you like it or not. But you know, you can take something out of Christmas scholarship. Um, the other one is the Rising Star Program. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. Um, it's not run by Alpha, it's run by a different area of the university. Um, and it's um, a situation where high achieving students are identified early on in their degrees and asked to come and participate in a scheme to learn more about research and professional development work. There are two other things you might like to think about as well. Okay, I'm definitely going to stop this one. I'm leaving now. So I might leave it there. I think next on the program was a Q&A session, but in the interest of running over time, what we might do is break for lunch. I know we're operating on a couple of different time zones. What time is it now, Kat? Uh, 12.41. 12.41. So and we would you come back at 1? Yes. One. So can we maybe ask for 20, 25 minutes for different campuses? For some of you, that will be five minutes past one. For others, it will be half past one or a bit after, whatever time zone you're in. Um, but if you want to break now, um, share some lunch with the people that you're at at your particular campus. Yep. Are we supposed to be going straight after you? Are you going now? Are you going yeah, lunch? before Are lunch. Before before lunch? Oh, I'm going to be back at grade school at one. Okay. Kate, then do you want to come up and do yours? Is that okay if I Yeah, do? that's fine. Or I, like, if you want to skip it, that's fine as well. But sorry, I'm just going to be back at one. Okay. Do people want to hear from Kate? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to come up? Sure. My apologies, I've got out of step. Michelle. So, Kate, come up. I've got yours. Yeah, yeah. 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 sorry. That's okay. 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 This is one of the great things about research, though, is you get to do a lot of teachers, get a lot of work. What is your school? Did you see? Um, yeah, so you do research there. Sorry. Oh, it's not, well, it's pretty far. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, can I introduce Caitlin George? Caitlin is one of our PhD students um, now. She commenced in a master's but moved across to the PhD. Um, and she's going to talk to you a little bit around what it's like to do research with the university, and I'll go straight to you. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't want to bore you too much with the detail about, um, I can flip through like that, yeah, um, of how I got into of, you know, my project, but sometimes it's interesting to hear about how people got into research, but I did not think research was my thing. I thought I hated statistics. I thought they were all really like, boring looking professors and like, you know, lines of code. This is this is my impression of research. And I'm a physiotherapist by trade, so I want to be out there on the sports field doing stuff, physically active. Like that's what I thought with my dad. I never thought research would be my thing. But after eight years of working clinically, doing the same thing most days, you know, you start to see these sort of repetitive patterns happen clinically. And I, I felt like there's this whole wealth of knowledge that I know and then my patients just wanted the same treatments and I felt like I wasn't being able to link in what I knew from the research and from what I'd learned from my university degree. Uh, I really wasn't feeling like I could link that in practically in my practice, in my in my practice. So I went and did I paid twenty one thousand dollars to do a um 
to do a graduate certificate of musculoskeletal physiotherapy. I was hunting for that extra education that I thought would help me be a better clinician, that would help me link the research and into my treatment of my patients. But I still, I came back and I was like, I've got all this great new knowledge of patients. Still, I found they just wanted the same thing. I wasn't, I still wasn't making that link. And so, but I actually was just coming up here on a locum job. I had no intention of joining research or anything like that. And I, from my locum position, I got some lecturing and tutoring work at the university. I'm like, hey, this is, this is really cool. This is where I'm able to help shape the direction that videos are coming out with. It felt like it was, I was able to achieve more good by helping people get an idea of what they would be expecting going out into the clinical workforce and, and helping them train to have good expectations, helping them train to have those difficult conversations with patients that I had to learn very clunkily over eight years of failed conversations or maybe not quite as good. So I got into the teaching first and then my supervisors, now my supervisors who were my um, work supervisors, hey, why don't you do a master's degree? I'm like, I can't afford another master's degree. It's too expensive, I don't have money, I don't have time. They're like, no, it's um, like Susan was saying, the government will sponsor your position. Oh, okay, yeah, why not? Let's, let's give that a crack. Um, and so I got a got with my supervisors. One of my supervisors was a content expert from UQ, and I said, great, I'm going to do my PhD on the same topic as Luke because he knows a lot about it, and it's going to be it's going to be good. I didn't have a real passion for any particular topic. I was more interested in learning the tools to be able to be a really good academic research, I love the teaching side of things. And now I had no idea of the research side of things. I sort of needed to fill in that gap because it's a large part of being an academic is understanding research and conducting the research. So I formulated a, a, a bit of a pet love of mine, which is tape. I was very much a sports physiotherapist. I taped it. If you, if you haven't taped them enough, you if you can't fix them with tape, you haven't taped them enough. <laughs> Some of my patients would look a bit like theory. <laughs> Um, and so I thought, why not combine one of my topics that I enjoy, which is tape and tennis elbow from my supervisor, who's a content expert in tennis elbow. And we brought it together. We, we've got this dynamic tape, which is on Tim K's up here. It's been commercially available for nine years, but nobody has done a study on it except this year. Mine was going to be the first, but this year somebody released a study. There's only one study on <laughs> dynamic tape, despite it being a mil like, you know, millions of dollars in sales and multi million dollars worth of endorsements from celebrities. We actually don't know if you need to apply like this much, we don't know if you need to apply this much, we don't know if it works, we don't know if it's psychological, we don't know if it's physical, the effect. So that's that's how sort of our project was born. And so what are the good bits about doing a research degree? Um, there's lots of varieties. Like every day you go to work as a physio and it's sort of going to look the same. People are in pain, you try to fix the pain, another person is in pain, you try to fix the pain. But I find I find research gives me heaps of variety. So that's a radio interview I did with Jackie Mackey on ABC. Um, that's the three minute thesis competition, which is if you're interested in research, it's worthwhile looking up some of those three MT projects because they they give you know the really good snapshot of what sort of research projects other people might be working on. Um, presenting in um, their Sports Medicine Australia Congress in Perth. Um, I got sent down to Brisbane, Brisbane to represent CQU for the um, annual dinner that they have for the Queensland Academy of Arts and Science and met some really cool people there. Um, it's really flexible. So if you want to work, if you hate getting up for 7 a.m., you never have to get up at 7 a.m. again. You can start working at 11. You write your own hours, you write, if I want to go work at a cafe, I'll go work at a cafe. If I want to work in, at my desk, which is provided by the university, lovely spot overlooking the pool, I can work at my desk. So like, um, I find the flexibility is really good. If you want to go get your hair cut and then come in in the afternoon and work till the evening, it's very, very flexible. And your supervisors are really only interested if you're meeting the work targets. They're not interested in whether you do it in your pyjamas or dressed in real people clothes. <laughs> Um, we get lots of cool training. Um, I think I'm a real Maria Gardner groupie, who's one of the um, like the training providers that come down and talks to us. Um, so lots of really cool, interesting training we get to do. I get to do some cool teaching stuff. Like I've learned all this extra stuff through teaching that I never would have done as a physio degree. I've done some quite high level exercise physiology stuff, which is really cool. Um, you get your laptop, you get your research funds, you get desk space, that sort of stuff. It's 
hard sometimes. This is this is my folder of systematic review revisions. There's 37 drafts of my systematic <laughs> review. I submitted it to five journals, and it's only just been accepted. Um, I've got my first publication for my PhD accepted. Yeah. Um, so sometimes you should like, oh yeah, you understand how to get this data, right? You're like, I have no idea what that even means. So um, you know, like depending on the complexity and the technicality of your project, you can you can have some difficult stuff to wrap your head around. And sometimes you feel really, really dumb. You, you look at something in two like, oh yeah, that's really interesting. I'm like, sorry, I'm I'm not even. I don't know what's going on for the first page there. Like, <laughs> you're right to the start. Um, but you do you stretch your knowledge. You hit that ceiling and you push it upwards on your knowledge. And, and I found I've done my two degrees now, and I've never been pushed as hard as in my PhD. And if you enjoy that, it's a really fantastic thing to see how far your knowledge can stretch. So that's on the bad side, but it's sort of a good thing as well. Um, drafts of writing, long long hours of writing, and long hours of feeling like you're not a very good writer. But you are becoming better. Um, late nights, <laughs> imposter syndrome, you know, feeling like everybody else is doing a really good job and you just feel like, you're like, I haven't even published a study yet. You know, so these are the feelings that are associated with it. But you can turn them into positives if you've got a good supervisory team, and I'm very lucky to have a good supervisory team. So for me, it's really worth it. I really love it. I love the variety, I love the skills that I'm learning about. Writing things that are, you know, adhering to policies, you know, stuff that I never got from my physio degree. So I'm able to take the stuff from my physio degree I really love, but then add a whole bunch of different skills into my skill set, which I never thought that I would have the capacity to do. But it's very achievable if you have a good team, if you have a good work ethic. Um, I think it's, I think it's a really worthwhile thing to consider. And if I could go back and tap myself on the shoulder eight years ago and say, "Are you going to be doing a PhD one day?" I would be like, "Nah, never." But it's a really worthwhile thing to do, and I would recommend, if you like the sound of it, to definitely investigate it, because it's been really good for me. Thank you. <laughs> now, I need to apologise to my dad, because I was talking until 12.30 and completely forgot that he was trying to speak to lunch. Um, I'm sorry, Holly, I'm going to come find me back to class. No problem. I had to rush back to a, a residential school. Oh, thank, thank, you. Before, thank you, guys. Um, Feel yeah. free to email me if you have any questions about physio related, like, you know, physio. Okay. okay. Can we just go to Holly and next week? Because Holly also has another community to get back to. Oh, oh, I know. I we will break from this. If you're right, the other campus and your lunch has already been arrived. Feel free to open the package and we just need to get going. Um, but in the meantime, can you use Holly Foster, who is also um, one of our current researchers? Thank you, Holly. I'll just bring up your slides for you. Um, I'm Holly. I'm a full-time PhD student. I'm lucky enough to have a scholarship. Um, I actually decided that I want to be a researcher when I was 14. I was really interested in um, the human body and how diseases happen, and I like to ask a lot of questions. So to me, I wanted to be a researcher, which my um, school and six my organised some work experience, and I came here to the pharmacology labs and um, did some work experience here, loved it. Um, I actually came home from the first day and told my parents I wanted to get a PhD, which looking back now um, is actually quite a big deal because um, no one had actually been to uni at all in my family and no one knew what a PhD was. Um, so I grew with that idea, um, finished school, um, signed up to do a Bachelor of Medical Science um, here at CTU. Um, as part of that, degree, you do actually have to do some work experience in the hospital. Um, I was hesitant, I was trying to go to the research lab, and they told me I have to do 10 weeks at the hospital. Um, for me, that actually showed me that you no know, 9 to 5 work isn't what I want to do, because I want to ask questions and find solutions and do research pretty much. So um, I approached all different researchers in the medical science field, um, just to do some work experience. So I went and did brief work. Um, I did some work in looking at supplements of um, like blueberries and looking at antioxidants and um, how they can help with clotting factors. Um, I found it was interesting, but it wasn't what I was passionate about. Um, I actually ended up doing an honours degree um, in the same research lab that I did my work experience in in year 10. Um, my, my research was in um, immunosuppressants that you take when you get an organ um, transplant and how it affects the cardiovascular system. I was really interested in it, but I actually found myself writing a lot about um, the side effects of cancer rather than the cardiovascular system. 
Um, so I was thinking, well, maybe I should find another sort of pathway going to the like cancer field. I also found that um, I was doing animal research then too. I found it very eventually draining because um, I liked my pet, but my rats, I sort of treat them like pets. I love them. <laughs> 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 At the end of the day, I'll be doing my research, which is the most I was just draining. Um, so I was investigating what other fields I can go that into. Um, I was actually very lucky where um, in my honors presentation where I was presenting my results, there's actually a um, supervisor who just came and joined the university and he was working in the field of cancer and he was looking for a PhD student and it was all based on cells. And I'm um, like, that was my normal animal research. Yeah, that's actually what that photo is um, there. I work on the biosafety cab now, I just work with blood and um, cell lines. So uh, my research is actually um, using DNA damage response as a diagnostic indicator for cancer risk. Um, so what that actually means is um, everyone else in like the field of cancer risk, they're actually really focused on genetics and genetic code, looking at um, how whether or not there's a mutation as like a yes or no of your cancer risk. Um, to put that into perspective, it's pretty rare to actually have a um, genetic mutation. My main cancer field that I look at is breast cancer. Um, to actually be eligible to get a genetic test for breast cancer, you have to have two or more relatives that have had breast cancer, and um, to actually get those tests. Um, only one in ten are actually um, positive for the mutation, so that means um, nine people who've got a big family history. They don't actually know why they're getting cancer, so that's where my project comes in. I'm actually looking more at the functional side, so rather, rather than being like a yes or no, if you've got a mutation, I look at um, the functionality of how well someone repairs the DNA after damage, and damage happens all the time. The sun causes damage, or the ear causes damage, just like it's living causes damage to our cells. Um, so that's what my project is all about. Aside from the ground up, we had this idea, the DNA supervisor had the idea that he wanted to um, look at whether or not how well you repair your DNA can indicate um, risk of cancer. And we went through the process of um, Finding out how to purify white blood cells and finding out how to grow them properly. Um, and now I'm up to the stage of I'm looking at time for repair. We've recently found out that instead of taking days that we thought, it was like um, happening within the first hour. And I'm just at the point where I'm um, like I'm optimizing the my assay in that hour to find out when is the best time to actually look at DNA you know, repair. And I'm so close to getting my participants. Um, the only thing I can say about research is negative is sometimes it can be very frustrating. Um, but it's, I've been doing my research for a year and a half, and I still am like doing the final optimizations where it's almost every time I supervisor says, I think this one is going to be the one where it works. <laughs> and then the final I put it off the concentration of this drug, where I like, extend the time with all the time, um, different incubation periods. That's the only thing that I can say that's negative about it. Sometimes it's like you're so close and so far still. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's been my dream job. So. Thanks very much, Ollie. <laughs> okay, we are going to break for lunch now. <laughs> Um, so can I sleep around 15 minutes and, um, and that should sort of get us back a little bit after lunch so we're running slightly more on um, So in Rockhampton, we're just going to stop you. We'll pop those early on you and we'll let you know on the chat line when we're about to reconnect. So um, a few minutes after one of us, we'll back 15 minutes time for those another time zones. I hope you enjoyed lunch and had some good conversations. Um, obviously, uh, please feel free to continue those conversations after the session. I know we have squeezed the time here, so I apologise for that. Um, we were uh, on the program going to have a short Q&A session. We sort of forfeited that in the interest of getting some um, lunch. Um, what we propose to do is if people could continue to post questions over chat or if they'd like to leave questions with any of us in the rooms, um, we'll get our FOQs document uh, published out to everybody. So we do want to answer your questions, but we might just run out of time today to do that. Um, if possible, if there's some time towards the end of the session, we'll return and answer as many as we can. But anything we haven't finished up on, We'll put into the FAQs documents and they have to report it. So please keep the questions coming. We definitely want to hear them. Um, we just need to manage our time a little as we go through. 
So the next um, hour or so is just a chance for you to hear from particularly different kinds of researchers across the university, so you get to rest from me. Um, there will be a little change in the order of speakers because we're trying to locate people who are at the other campuses, so just bear with us um, in regards to that. But our first speaker can I introduce Dr Jo Luck. So Jo's presenting from here in Rockhampton. Um, jo is currently the acting deputy dean of research for the School of Engineering and Technology. So you might know that the university is uh, categorised into schools or discipline areas. Um, so for engineering and technology students, um, all your research areas are going to, to Jo and the supervisors that she has there. So I'll pass over to Jo and you can go ahead. Okay, so that's the. Uh, no, I just press. Like, just that? Okay, so. Um, and she just introduced me. I was going to say, when uh, she sent me the program, and there's all the big speakers in 45 minutes, I thought it was a bit like speed dating <laughs> to sell you <laughs> from the product before I move on to the, to the next one. So, um, as she said, we, um, in engineering, which covers uh, engineering technology or ICT, information and communication technology. We also have project management, built environment, and aviation is a, a, a new area that we started, and now we've got um, a whole building that we've got at Cairns Airport where our aviation stuff, or a lot of our aviation stuff are located. So, uh, Susan has touched on this before a little bit, I heard before, that, that two, we've got two research centres there, um, which is um, the Centre for Research Engineering and Intelligent Systems. So I'm hoping that Susan will send out these slides to you. I've got links there. So if you are interested in railway engineering or anything to do with intelligent systems, you can um, just click on the link and, and contact the staff. So the railway engineering is heavily focused on links with industry. Um, and you know, if you read through the site, it talks about trains and bogies and railway lines and they're checking for maintenance and stuff like that. Uh, so they do some work that's out in the field and then they do other work that's simulation work. Um, they're there, and they're based in Rockhampton, so most of the staff working there are in Rockhampton, but they do have students, they've got a student that's over in Western Australia, is Perth as well. The other research centre is the Centre of Information System, Intelligence Systems, sorry. Um, uh, the head of that is based in Brisbane, but again, we're spread out across the campuses and we have like uh, experts in that across the area. They're looking at applied technologies, you know, computer technologies, um, in ICT and engineering applications mainly, but also looking at you know, artificial intelligence, robotics, um, smart devices, etc. And um, the Clean Energy Academy, again, uh, Susan mentioned that earlier, it just started in the 1st of January, and so uh, this is Mohamed Rasul, but he is, is known by Rasul, and uh, he just started that up and he's building up the research high degree students. Uh, himself and the, the other team of supervisors uh, looking at you know, renewable energy, environment and issues in engineering and he has too lots of links to with the School of Health and Medical and Applied Sciences in there as well, I'll sort of, uh, sort of that way. And the other link I've got there that I'll send out is that um, the research division has set up these potential projects. So you know, if you're thinking about, when I think about ideas and stuff, you can click on that link there, and that one goes to engineering and technology links, but you can go and sort there and, and you know, go to any school, what any school has in there. That particular link will just take you to the 11 projects um, that are there for our school. And the, the last thing I had was just <coughs> myself, who, as I said, I'm acting DR at the moment because uh, the dean is uh, day diving in Mexico, um, but it's uh, back on Monday. But my other role is I look after the research high degree students within my school. Um, so that's what I do, that's half my job. And just a, a heads up, uh, I also, in another, in my other hat on, is one of those coursework units that Susan was talking about that prepare for confirmation that uh, research high degree students have to do. I teach that to the terms of the year. So, if you have any questions, I'm happy to ask you. Okay. You're all good. Oh, I'll tag team with the next one. Then. See how the speed dating goes. Thank you, Jo. Um, and Jo makes a good point, a detail that I skipped over when I was speaking. Um, if you would like to connect with supervisors or prospective supervisors, and those aren't the lecturers that you're already engaged with in your degree studies, um, there are some ways you can go about that. So one of the um, easiest things is to contact the Deputy Dean Research for the school that you're in or your degree is in. So those are people whose literally job it is to connect up new students with prospective supervisors. So don't feel like you need to go finding out who the professors are in that space. 
just go and ask them if you need research. We'll send you out a list of who those people are, and Jo is, is one of them, she mentioned, or she's about to leave for her school. Um, so if all else fails and you can't find someone to talk to, send an email to them, and they can connect you up with the staff that are in your interest area. So thank you very much, Jo, for that. Um, can I ask you a sound check? Can you hear that, Stella? Are you in Adelaide and ready to go? I'm in. I'm in. I can see you, Susan. You're on. Yes. Can you, can you, you, can have you see? Yeah, you I got slides. Can load them from your end? Oh, can great. I share them? Oh, <laughs> okay. Can you speak up for a sec so we can check the sound? Uh, check one, two, check one, two. No. no. You can't hear me? Nope. Oh. We can hear you. <laughs> great. That's all that matters to me. <laughs> I we can hear it. We can hear it through the Zoom. Are you getting it on the X? Yeah. Just us in the room. It's just this. So, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, so, so, would you mind? I'm going to speak to the next speaker and get on the phone to the teaching tech so we can get the sound tuned on here. Would that be okay? Give us five minutes. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we'll wait for your. Um, do you want me to Mark, stop sharing? Can I ask you to come on? Yeah, yeah. Just while we're It's it happened the other day, and you've just got to push the button on there. I don't know. Which Yes, I can. <laughs> okay, do you want me back on now? Yes, please go ahead. Uh hold on one second. All right. Um okay, we good? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so I've been asked to talk about psychology, specifically sleep, occupational health and safety, and safety. Um, but what I actually wanted to do, Susan, can you just get out there on the front for me? Awesome. And what I want, mm -hmm. uh, what I want everyone to do out there in the CQ universe is to actually think about what happens when you don't get enough sleep to yourself. So you have 30 seconds, think about three things that happen to you when you don't get enough sleep. And Susan, you might want to write a couple of these things down from your audience. Okay. Because I'm just going to use it in the next few slides. Okay. So 30 seconds starting now. Okay. So Merrick, you might have to collate responses on chat line if we get them. If that's okay, because I can't see the chat connect. Yeah, that's okay. Merrick will monitor them there. People have rocketed. Do you want to give me some clues? It's a little sugary food. Each, we're just going to yell them out from here. Each yeah, yell them out. Keep yelling them out. That's fine. Okay, eat sugary food. Get the rum rum. Yeah. Get the Slow reflexes. Slow down to reflexes. Yours. Yours. Emotional. Micro sleep. Yeah, emotional. Having micro sleeps and feeling emotional. Yep. Thanks for calling that out online. Hang on the chat. Uh, sensitive, lack of motivation. Lack of motivation, what becomes sensitive? Yeah. Yep. Is that that? Yeah, that's plenty. Great. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> everything we do here down in Adelaide, we're one of the largest sleep labs in the Southern Hemisphere, and we look at a lot of things related to what happens when we don't get enough sleep. So, if you think about some of the things that happen to you when you have a lack of sleep, which I'm sure most of us have been in situations where we haven't, we actually have an impairment in mood, which some people were saying grumpy, emotional. Sensitive was quite an interesting one because there's some studies done on how much we exacerbate our emotions when we're sleep deprived. So that was actually quite a good comment, whoever made sensitive. Also, we look at decision making. So we look at cognitive performance, our reaction times, whether we make good decisions or poor decisions, and whether or not we engage in risky behaviour, whichever way you want to interpret risky behaviour, it encompasses all of those things that you're thinking about associated with riskiness. Also, we look at recovery and 
let's say, athletic performance. We also look at accidents, so why certain times of day there are an increase in accidents. And a lot of the work we do around the place is related to emergency services. So looking at obviously police force, ambulance services, and firefighters. So a lot of that's related to sustained wakefulness. So the longer we are awake, the more likely we are to make errors as the day increases or the, lo the, the longer we have a sustained wakefulness. Some of the other areas around our department is related to gambling research. We're pretty big in that space. Also homelessness. We have um, Danielle Avery who does a lot of research on homelessness and, and, and sleep and the psychological effects there. And we also have dingoes. So we do a lot of research on human animal interaction. So Dr. Bradley Smith does a lot of research in that space. So basically the benefits of psychology is that we are extremely flexible. So anything in your mind that you're interested in researching or conducting studies on, then we're the go-to because we're quite flexible and we're quite innovative. So I've always say to my students, when you're doing an assignment and you have I guess free will to choose or some room to choose, do something you're extremely interested in. Because if you start your research journey <coughs> with a high, high level of motivation, then you're more likely to succeed and you're more likely to be interested in what you're actually researching. So I was going to go into our lab, but I don't think we really need to go into too much. But just let me leave you with that, that psychology is flexible and we're adaptable. That's all. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Nick. So, um, Nick is part of the team down at Appleton Institute. That was one of those centre institutes that you were in. He probably wondered what Appleton was. So Appleton is one of the founders of the university, so that's where that comes from. Um, but it is the, the research institute that looks after the areas that Nick's just talked about. Um, they do have a sleep lab down at Appleton, so it's a really cool bunker place where they take people and you can't see the sunshine. You know, they take your mobile phones off you, so you have no idea what time it is, and they want to help people sleep and people change. Um, but there's also a range of other psychology um, staff around the university. So there's a group in, in Bundaberg, for example, some down in Melbourne. So quite a few of you actually mentioned psychology on your interest areas. Um, so please start thinking about whether or not you might like to connect with Thank you very much, Nick. No worries. Okay. We'll turn that volume back down again. <laughs> Um, next, we have Mark Trotter. If Mark would like to make his way on down, so this is Associate Professor Mark Trotter. Mark's delivering from Rockhampton. Bear with me. You want me to pull up the website for yes, you? Yes, all right. Can we... yeah. you know, do you know it? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, a number of you in indicated your interest areas in either automation or agriculture. Um, sometimes those are linked, but for the purposes of today, we put them together. So, partly that's in the engineering school, partly it's in our school of health, medical, and applied sciences, because that's where our agricultural and environmental students um, study their work from. So, Mark is part of a group called the Institute for Future Farming Systems, which includes a range of livestock, uh, cropping, irrigation. Um, agricultural technologies, other things. No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> right. A little bit, a little bit of background uh, on me and my story. So I grew up on a little dairy farm down the middle coast of New South Wales. Went to uni uh, and then I went out in the industry. Was a, a banker for a while and then came back to research because I was really interested in in that particular area and, and getting involved in that and really sort of solving a lot of the problems that. I experienced on a farm growing up as a, as a kid. Uh, and that's sort of driven a lot of my personal research for the last decade or, or more, I guess. Um, Susan mentioned I'm part of the Institute of Future Farming Systems. Um, and so we have in that uh, precision livestock, which is my field. Watching them wander around the paddock and understand a whole bunch of other applications. Uh, and then we also have um, precision horticulture, um, and that's looking at a whole range of different tree crop, horticultural, high value crop um, uh, systems. And things like that. Uh, and then another uh, research cluster called uh, Non Invasive Sensor Systems. And these guys, uh, Kerry Wash, 
They've got some um, really neat um, sensor systems so they can determine how bright things like mangoes are. And so uh, a lot of really good um, industry um, uh, things coming out of that particular cluster. And then we've got some other emerging and younger groups, so cropping, uh, cropping systems, tropical cropping systems is a new one. And so that's about uh, cropping systems up here in northern Australia, so all sorts of things like growing black sesame and some other really innovative new spice crops. Uh, and then extension and engagement, that's about engaging with farmers to help them improve their adoption technology as well. Um, so all, across all of those clusters, we're really about sort of having a real industry impact. And so you know, my personal experience, you know, my drive is about you know, solving a lot of the problems uh, that I had growing up on the farm. And um, a lot of the other researchers in our um, institute are really about the same sort of thing. And so I've just thrown up one of our platforms. So this is a, the Data Master platform, which was developed before my time up here. But you can go on today if you really can to have a look around that. There's actually a demo. It's a, it's a data management system for farmers, for livestock managers. Um, and, and as a researcher, what I'm doing is I'm actually, all the students that work with me on the past issues, working on technologies that are going into this particular system so it can be rolled out for producers. And so we're really shortening the gap between research and then the impact of that technology actually getting out into the sector. And you will not find that anywhere else in Australia or in the world, really, in terms of agriculture. And um, I know the horticulture guys are working on a similar sort of platform for their work, and Kerry with non invasive sensor systems has the same thing as well. So it's really about making stuff work for farmers to improve. Uh, their sustainability and productivity. Um, there's lots of different options, I guess, within our PhD program. So we're working on things like dual degrees, so relationships with, in particular, Ohio State University in the US. New Mexico State University is actually a dual degree. You get a PhD from both here and over there as well. Um, there's some really good advantage for that. We just had students uh, doing field work over in the US as part of that relationship as well, having a really great experience. Um, I think one of the things I'd like to say is because a lot of you guys have got nothing to do with that, but we have a lot of interest in um, a range of different disciplines. So just because you're not off a farm or, or haven't had anything to do with agriculture, don't think what you're interested in isn't necessarily relevant. Um, uh, things like business and economics as applied to, to agriculture, um, data analytics is really big across all of our disciplines. We're really looking for um, PhD students in that particular area. Uh, to help us solve some of these really big sensor based, all this data coming out of these sensors, so we need to make sense of that. Uh, things like social science, understanding how um, producers make decisions and improving that decision making process, and, and a whole range of engineering things from, from the basics all the way through robotics as well. Um, and so I guess probably, uh, I guess a really big feature of our PhD program is about designing that program to take you where you want to go. So as a student going on an RHD, you know, I've got students who want to go into academia, so they want to become a, an academic, they want to become a researcher, or students who want to go back out into industry and, and um, go into pharmaceutical companies and, and apply their stuff in there. And so we really um, uh, customise that PhD, that RHD journey, according to where you want to end up. And they, they can be quite different pathways if you are going into research or you are going back out into industry. It's something we work with to make sure that experience that you get, the activities that you go through are actually take you where you want to end up. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Mark. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, we're going to have a few questions from the Let me speak, chat them. Did that not work? Sorry. Oh, sorry, oh, she's on. I was here. Sorry. <laughs> 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 I'll still be the same person later. Pam's all ready to go. We're taking it. Thank you. We go into. 
Oh, we are. Okay. Hi, I'm Sue Davis. I'm Deputy Dean Research for the School of Education and the Arts. And so in our school, we look after education, the humanities and creative arts. But Liz Allison is going to talk about creative arts. In terms of research centres, the education focused one is the LEAP Centre, which is about learning, equity, access, participation, and a real focus on a number of projects with regions and also um, people with disabilities, the NDIS scheme, etc. Um, in education, I guess, people are generally looking at um, learning and teaching in some sort of educational context. So yes, many of our RHD students are teachers, um, principals or education workers, but also a lot of um, lot of CQU staff who are you know working in higher education. So you don't have to do an ED or um, a doctorate focused on education only if you're a teacher. In most cases, people are looking at some aspects that relate to their context and practice. It's some sort of inquiry. They're often wanting to test out a new model, create a new model, compare models that sort of thing. And in fact, sometimes occasionally we'll get people coming and saying, I want to do a Doctor of Education and I want to find out what's the impact of teaching music in primary schools. And then I look at their background and they've got a Bachelor of Business and they've actually got no education or music experience. So you go, well, why do you want to do that? Oh, I think it'll be really interesting. So that's when we go, well, you might want to rethink that. So generally it is for people who've got some education background, experience and working in a context. But I guess it's that idea of, yes, it can be school-based, but it's not only you can, if it's, you know, people working in higher ed. So people like, for example, in sonography, who are wanting to look at their practice. We've got a number of um, CQU staff that have been looking at what's the impact of, you know, or comparing uh, distance learning compared to face-to-face -to -face and all of those kinds of things. So um, if you're interested in that sort of work, um, come and have a chat to us. Some of the other areas of specialist interest, we have the STEM Hub in Gladstone, and that's a fantastic physical centre. Um, there's a number of uh, researchers in that field. We've also got a um, number of people from arts education backgrounds, um, a language and literacy um, assessment reporting, um, uh, neuroscience, education and neuroscience. So there's some of the areas where we've got supervisors at the moment. Is that it? Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, there's one other grouping within Sue School, which is the Creative Arts Academy, um, and what we've got Liz coming along at the end of the session to talk more about Carter. So thank you, Sue. Pam, this time, <laughs> come on down. There you go. Uh, can I answer? Person. Um, and so I'm actually occupational therapy as um, was introduced, but I will talk just a little bit about a couple of the others as well. So um, I guess what we find in our school is that most people who come and do one of the therapies or one of the health professions, allied health, uh, exercise physiology, actually do so with a view to going on then and being a practitioner or a therapist or a clinician. You know, that's very often the focus. But I think now, actually, probably more than ever before, we have a really big move towards evidence-based practice and towards implementation science. And now more than ever before, we're really seeing that interface narrow, where uh, researchers are really popular in clinical centres and clinicians are really popular in academic centres. So those lines are really blurry now, and those, um, those two practices are really strongly and heavily uh, reinforcing and informing each other, which is great. So I just thought to give you a sense of what the sort of work is that we're doing, I'd share a couple of um, my studies and what some of my students are looking at. Um, I do a fair bit of work with attachment theory or developmental um, approaches to, um, to life, basically, is what I'm covering. So one of my real interests is looking at substance use, and this was a study that we did with adolescents, where we looked at what some of the risk factors are for the substance use, and how that was related then to health outcomes. So that's just an example there, looking at um, attachment theory and sensory sensitivity as vulnerability factors for substance use, and then um, the, the links between substance use and distress and quality of life. So you can see, you know, we, when we understand what the theoretical um, rationales are behind what's going on in the real world, 
And that can tell us, well, what are some of the interventions we might want to develop or that might be available already that we might not be using. So that link, I think, is really clear there between practice and science. Uh, and that's something that we really emphasise all the way through. What I really like about um, the therapies uh, and about all of the programs, and I think the points that's been made already, is that you don't need to be an occupational therapist to be supervised in a PhD. Doctor, I supervise supervising, and the same thing happens the other way. So OT students might go to somebody else and be supervised by another profession. So you know, having an interest um, is the really the really important starting point for you, and then finding the match of the educator is more important than actually what their professional backgrounds are. So just a few more examples of. So these are some of my postgrad students at the moment, and I know that's still tiny writing, but. Um, you know, if we pick out a few of them here, we're looking at assessment and intervention for children with fetal alcohol syndrome. Okay, so you can see there's a really wide diversity here. There's another one here looking at um, assessment and intervention pathways for children and youth with comorbid intellectual disability and mental health concerns. Um, we've got chronic pain in there. We've got non-compliance post-burn with garments, so lots of those sorts of therapeutic approaches. But within our school, there's a really wide range. So exercise physiology is a really big research area in our school. There's uh, lots of work being done at the moment with um, health and fitness, with uh, motivation to exercise, with um, supporting women particularly um, postnatally uh, to regain um, their health and fitness. Uh, I can't even begin to tell you the wide range of research that's happening across physio, speech pathology, um, chiropractics, just big long list, podiatry, nursing. No, they've got their own school, haven't they? <laughs> so, I was on the table with them yesterday at their careers day. Um, so I guess I just mainly wanted to give you a taster about what we've got in therapies and um, good luck on your journey. I'm sure that this will be a really interesting start for you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ben. Um, and I really like Pam's advice that regardless of which disciplinary you're currently in, um, if you're thinking about coming into research, it's probably not the case that you just need to be having conversations only in your own discipline space. Connect up with people who are elsewhere in the uni, and you've already hopefully started to hear that we have a whole bunch of research going on out there, and you're probably blissfully unaware of it because you've just been dealing with your current you know, bachelor degree lecturing and stuff. Um, there are people right across the university, which is why you can connect with us, tell us a bit about what you're interested in, and we'll shoot you some names to start thinking about. Okay, on to our next presenter, who is Jenny Barr. Is she online? Yes, I think she is. So Jenny, I think, is in Brisbane today. Yep. yep. Am I on? Can you hear me, Susan? Uh, I can hear you, but we can't get a visual. Okay, oh. do you want me to stand? Oh, you can have a visual. Oh, oh wait. No, you can You can down. Is that, is that better? Sorry guys, I do think about going to, and the reason I haven't got a PowerPoint is because we're in a meeting room which makes it more difficult. So um, I'm the Deputy Dean Research of the School of Nursing, Midwifery and Social Sciences, which means social work and sociologists. Um, I just want to reinforce what Pammy just said. In fact, Pam and I uh, have supervised together. And yes, we've got OTs too, Pam, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we have a variety of disciplines in, in one school. So we are, it's very easy for us to look in a creative way of what we can do. But some of our strengths, we've got the Centre for Domestic and Family Violence Research, and they're just getting into gender violence as well um, and sexual abuse. So they're broadening. That is um, a very important area for us, and we look at that from all sorts of different angles. So it could be practice, it could be education, it could be policy, so correctional services, police, it's, it's right across. So even just that in its own right is incredibly complex. Um, we have others in the school that look at health services. So of course, when nursing, midwifery and social work, clearly health services are typically with those, but we have others coming to us all the time because some of those principles that work in, say, nursing can go across into another area. 
Um, one of our strengths in that area is quality and safety, uh, which is a very important part of it. But there's others like resilience. We're doing a lot of work with resilience in organisations. Um, there are other school members and centre members that actually have resilience for individuals. So for example, uh, one study I can think of is uh, looking at resilience of um, family and friends who are observing domestic violence. That's an example of one of our master students. And she's looking at what happens, what's their experiences, because currently all the literature is in fact about the person who's receiving the violence or the perpetrator that's actually uh, the violent person. So there's a lot of uh, gaps in this literature. The other area that we're very strong in is uh, teaching and learning, but we're particularly strong because we've got all practice-based disciplines in the school. We're particularly strong on uh, simulation. And of course, and we've got a lot of practice disciplines that are in other schools. And so some of those generic principles are being used across into other disciplines. And, and uh, more and more people come to our school either as associate supervisors or enrolling for simulation. And it's, it's multiple versions of simulation that's developing. Um, okay, another area of strength that we've got is mental health. And in fact, we've got uh, two schools with particularly strong mental health. So that's mental health and wellbeing. I mentioned resilience before, but we've got suicide prevention that people are working on. We've got health service delivery for mental health. So the NDIS is struggling with disability, how to manage those that have actually got mental health challenges because they don't quite neatly fit. And so they often fall through the cracks. So there's a few people working on that, which is really cool. Um, there is um, uh, another area is, is in fact um, looking at how do we improve some of the service delivery. So one of our key researchers that's growing in her, now she's going internationally, there was a instigated work by Queensland Health about a term nurse navigator. Really it's a fancy way of saying we have to improve chronic illness and how it's managed. That's pretty much how it started. And it's now filtering right across internationally as well. So, so we are, um, we've got very strong areas, but in amongst all that, we welcome other disciplines to come in as not just students, but also their disciplines. Uh, we have um, really good international links. So we actually will link people up into international experts that um, will add to that. Um, and so we've got, uh, for example, I have um, a person from Indonesia, for example, who's a specialist in disability, and we have some students in the school. So she's my colleague, but some of my other people have got students for disability, um, and she's literally an external supervisor for those students. So that's just one example. Um, yeah, so basically we welcome people, we welcome the collaboration as well. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jenny. Um, you might have noticed the signal came up five minutes to end. We were just getting the tech services team to just extend us up until two o'clock. Um, so thank you, Jenny. Um, so through today's sessions, you've actually managed to meet three out of the five schools that we have for their deputy dean's research. So Jenny is the deputy dean researcher for nursing, the Bibbury in social sciences. Sue Davis, who you met last, was the um, one for education in the arts, and Joe, who was here first of all, was the engineering and technology. Um, there's two others, so there's one for business and law, his name is Julian Tasha, uh, and the one for health, medical, and applied sciences uh, is a shared role between a person called Sally Ferguson and someone called Tony Seymour. But we'll send all these names out to you so that you know who they are. Thank you, Jenny. Um, we've got three speakers to go. Next on the list is Emma Jackson, who should be beating in from Gladstone. If you're there, Emma, can you take over? Try again. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yep, we sure can. We can see, yeah. can you see the screen. Camera left the wall. Yep, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay, Emma, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I'm just going to cover the um, environment and sustainability research. Um, so we've got three main areas of focus with research um, within our school. We've got um, aquatic ecology and ecotoxicology, and the uh, research leader for that one is Nicole Flint. Um, marine and coastal restoration, which is myself, and conservation biology, which is Owen Nevin, who's in the room today. And um, to 
basically get in touch with um, the right supervisors and um, the Deputy Dean of Research for our school is um, Sally Ferguson, as just mentioned. So this ranges across a number of different disciplines from um, water quality, um, ecotoxicology, right the way through to looking at um, conservation of, of bears and, and here in those wombats. So it's a real massive range of, of different disciplines. Um, and it includes not just chemistry, physics, biology, but also social sciences and economics. So there's also a lot of cross collaboration between different um, schools and different researchers. Um, Sink University has some really great locations around Australia for environment and sustainability research, including um, the number of studies that are actually offshore. Um, so we have a number of offshore international students. Um, and this includes six campuses within the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area. Um, and my focus is marine, so I might be a little bit biased talking about that. Um, so the research that we do tends to matter not just locally, but also globally. Um, and this is just a picture to um, show that this is Gladstone, which is the um, largest multi um, commodity port in Queensland and the fifth largest coal port in the world. And it's also within the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area, as you can see there. Um, my research focuses on seagrass restoration and the health of the marine environment and like a lot of the previous speakers have said, you know, a lot of our research is about linking up with industry and collaborating with the best people um, to, to do that research. Um, so the research that I'm particularly doing is linked with a, a lot of different organisations you can see there. But we also have PhD students that are, are related to um, a number of local, more local sort of partnerships. So this is the Glass and Healthy Harbour Partnership, where Nicole Flint leads a number of projects looking at um, coastal indicators for fish and mud crab health. Um, we have um, a project funded by the Port Curtis Integrated Monitoring Program, um, which is looking at subtropical seagrasses as a potential bioindicator. So that's actually going to be providing the, the um, research basis to actually start using this seagrass locally as an indicator going forward in, in quite a major project that program that includes a lot of different industry partners. Um, and we also do a lot of linking up across disciplines in terms of, um, this, this is a good example, in terms of linking environmental sciences to things like agriculture. So this is a project by Julianne Milan, who's working on looking at optimal placement of off-stream watering points to protect and improve riparian ecosystems and water quality. So a really nice marriage of, of the two different disciplines there. Um, and I just wanted to do a plug at the end of my five minutes for the new marine and coastal um, Ecosystems Research Centre, which is starting up um, and will be based in Gladstone. Um, there will be a number of funded um, masters and PhD opportunities available through this centre, which is going to be really looking at new ways of managing competing interests of urban, industrial and extractive use demands within our amazing aquatic and marine ecosystems. Um, and also to mention that we have a number of options for actually trying before you buy, basically, and come along and actually do an internship, do a student placement, volunteer with us to actually see if you're interested in the marine, um, marine the environmental science research that we do um, in this area before you actually start on your RHD course. And I'll leave it there. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, some really good opportunities there going on in Gladstone, um, particularly the funding attached, so those don't come along very often. So definitely make contact with Emma. We'll provide the details out to you. Um, you've probably noticed the session time in keeps updating. Unfortunately, we will leave um, this room and several of the other campus rooms at 2 o'clock because other lectures are coming in. We've got two last speakers, which is Olaf Merling and Ruth Elton. Um, Olaf, are you ready to go? I think so. Can you hear me, uh, yes, Susan? Yes, sure can. Um, if you could possibly keep it brief, yes. if that's okay. I do apologise for that. I just know we're going to get the cut off at two, that's all. No problem. Uh, yeah. I've got no slides, so I'll just very quickly speak to it. Um, look, School of Business is very broad. It's not the boring, not just the boring accounting and finance stuff, I shouldn't say that. But, you know, that some of the concentrations that, um, that we do have is tourism, tourism marketing, regional economics, um, we've also got a fair emerging concentration in non-profit research, um, voluntary uh, sector research, and importantly, um, which is my field, social innovations. So social innovations about changing the world, um, dealing with problems that governments and corporations are struggling to deal with, working out clever new ways to uh, tackle those problems. Um, like a lot of the other presenters, I'd make the point that it is all very interdisciplinary. I often work with co-supervisors from other uh, faculties or other schools. Um, and that's one of the things that's different about CQU. We've got less narrow silos. 
Um, the other thing that I'd point out, in case you haven't heard this more than enough already, is that CQU is exceptional in the level of support it provides to RHDs. We have higher levels of financial support, higher levels of training support than almost any other uni, and it's no accident that the majority of my PhD students are refugees from much more prestigious universities. Um, so they <laughs> failed. <laughs> They fail to finish PhDs at places like Griffith, QUT and um, University of Queensland and have come and finished them here at CQU. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not appropriate. So uh, one, qu one quick final point, um, it, uh, just a general point. Remember the PhD is a, a driver's licence, it's not a narrow driver's licence. Once you've finished, you can't just take a four-cylinder automatic, you should be able to drive anything up to a truck. Um, so there is a, there's a great deal of, um, you know, it's a general qualification becoming less and less specific and don't think of it too narrowly. It's not just a specialist qualification, it's more than that. It's a general qualification in research. Thanks, Susan. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Badly that we're denying these last few speakers their full speaking time. And what I might invite them to do is if they wanted to pop a short uh, two minute YouTube, we'll get that circulated out to people because I know there's a number of you who wanted to hear more about social innovation in particular. Um, so I'll, I'll find out if that's possible. Um, last but not least is Liz Ellison. Liz, are you there in Noosa? I am. Can you hear me? Well, we can hear you but not see you yet. No, well, that's okay. okay. <laughs> right. my yeah, you're good now. Okay, go ahead. See me now. For the purpose of, of time, I won't worry too much about slides. Just a, a really quick um, plug, I suppose, for the creative arts part of education and the arts. Uh, in particular, for instance, we have the Creative Arts Research Training Academy, and in that we have a lot of students who come together as a bit of a cohort in our creative arts discipline. So that includes people who do what we call traditional thesis, for instance, where they might uh, write a traditional thesis that looks at sort of literature or humanities, but also the creative arts on the practice side. So visual artists, creative writers uh, who are really thinking about process, thinking about how to be creative, uh, actually doing a lot of innovative work in, in sort of generating new forms of creative products as well. So that's part of what we sort of do here. It's always about um, thinking about you know, what is it about viewing the world through a particular lens, particularly informed by our own practice. Um, probably I'll leave it a bit there. I've got some examples and things I can talk through with anyone who does want to talk a little bit more about that type of work. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liz. That was short and sweet. Um, I guess one of the things uh, people may not be aware of is, it, 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 as Liz explained, it's more than possible to do uh, research in creative arts. So you might go and create a sculpture and then write a research piece that goes with it, or a performance, and then go and write a research piece that works with it. Most people think of research as something that's done at the bench for the lab. You know, laboratory mice, all those other things. But creative arts is a really important part of that research, and that's why we've got the academy established in that area. So thank you, Liz, and thank you for being brief. Um, but I'll, I'll come back to you too if you want to um, grab the YouTube for card up as well. So look, we are running really close to time. Thank you, everyone, um, for making the time to come along. I hope that's at least given you the beginnings of a taste of what research is like. As you probably gathered, there's so much more we could tell you. <laughs> um, so please um, come and engage with us. Um, what I uh, will undertake is that in the next uh, probably week to fortnight, we'll get um, an information package out to everyone who's attended today. So we'll give you the slides from today, we'll give you some contact details for people you can talk with, we'll give you the course of prospectus, all of that kind of stuff. Um, where possible, for those of you who mention particular topic areas that you're keen on, we will try and see if we can hook you up with particular people to talk with. We might not be able to do that for everybody, but we'll try where we can. So in the next week or two, look out for an email from us. Um, we'll definitely be in touch. So thank you to everyone um, who's joined online as well as in person at our different campuses. I hope you enjoyed lunch, and if you'd like to stay around and have further chats after the session is finished, um, please do so. But otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.